There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. Last evening, I started talking to you about Jesus and the disciples, and we started, we started in the early chapters of the Gospel according to Matthew where Jesus called the first disciples to himself. You remember, it was two sets of fishermen brothers. There was Simon Peter and Andrew. There was James and John. And uh, Jesus used the same two words with them, he used the same two words throughout the book, and he used the same two words with us. And those two words are, follow me. All the way through, Jesus was calling people to follow him. That's really what it means to be a disciple. It's to be a learner or a follower of the Lord Jesus. Now, the really interesting thing about Jesus and the disciples is that the disciples were not unusual men. They weren't anything special. Nobody would have picked them out of a lineup. Nobody would have said they're the most likely to succeed. In fact, they were the most unlikely hodgepodge group of guys you've ever seen in your life. Most of them were poor. Most of them were fishermen, most of them from the Galilee. These were just common, ordinary men. The great thing about their lives was not what they did. The great thing about their lives is what Jesus did with them. The great thing about their lives was not that they made something of themselves. It was that God made them something that He wanted them to become. They were all from different backgrounds, for example, in the same group of the early disciples, you've got a Jewish trader named Matthew who's a tax collector, a sellout to Rome, hated by, by the Jewish community, and a guy named Simon who was a zealot. The zealots were the political party that wanted to, to march on Rome and shed blood in the name of Israel and riot in the streets. They were so full of anger and, and hatred, and I love this, Jesus, only Jesus could do this. Jesus brought a, a Jewish sellout and a zealot together in the same group and made them one. What did they have in common? They only had one thing in common. They had Christ in common. I'm looking across this room right now, and there's a lot of different people in here. Look at your neighbor. How many of you think your neighbor's different than you? Yes? Some very different, right? How many of you are glad you're different from them? Yes? But look at me just a second. Though we are all different, if you know Jesus as your Savior, we have Christ in common. The disciples were an unlikely and unique group. It's interesting, but in all of their list, one name is always first. Anybody like to guess who is always first on every list? He's going to be the leader when Jesus is gone, if that helps any. Simon Peter. He's the one that Jesus would say, when I'm gone... You're going to feed my sheep. You're going to feed the lambs. Did you know they're always organized the same way? They're always in the same groups of three. For example, the first three on every list is the inner circle disciple, Peter, James, and John. They're always first. But if you look at the rest of the list, in, in every occasion where the list is given, the same groups of three are always coupled together. Four groups of three. Almost like Jesus had them ordered, organized a certain way so that they could function. Some of them we know a lot about. 
Some of them we know next to nothing about. For example, if I said to you, stand and tell me everything you know about Bartholomew. I'd like to know everything you know about Bartholomew. And you know, the reality is we're going to meet him in heaven someday. He was one of the original disciples, also goes by Nathaniel. But we don't know nearly as much about him as we do about Simon Peter. And then there is a man that is last on every list. He is not last because he is least. Hear me carefully. He is not last because Jesus didn't love him. In fact, before we're done tonight, I'm going to show you that Christ cared for this man because he cares for all people. He was last on the list because he was lost. Imagine being in the first church and not knowing the founder. Imagine having your name on the membership roll of the first church that ever existed on the planet and the pastor is Jesus. But though you are there, you're not really a believer. I want you to open your Bible tonight to the end of the gospel according to Matthew, to Matthew chapter number 26. And I'm going to show you tonight one of the saddest characters in all the Bible and yet one of the happiest messages when we're done. Look at Matthew chapter number 26. Tonight, I'm speaking to you on Jesus and Judas. We know him now as a traitor. His name is synonymous with it. Nobody names their daughter Jezebel, and nobody names their son Judas, and there's a reason for that. In fact, did you know, did you know, there are two men named James in the original disciples, and there are also two Judases, and one of them In Scripture, it says Judas, not Iscariot. To to clarify, this is not the traitor because names matter. And this man's name is eternally connected to the worst things because he rejected Jesus. Look at Matthew 26 and verse number 14. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest And said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. Stop and look at me just a second. He's telling on himself. See, your mouth always tells on your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Look at that verse. What what can I get out of this? See, that's that's all some people want. They they only hang around Jesus as long as they can get something out of him. They, They only look at a church by what they can get out of it. Pardon me. They only come to a youth group and come to camp because they think they might get something out of it. Judas missed the whole point. Do you understand that Jesus is the ultimate giver? And here he is negotiating for a few pieces of silver and rejecting the very giver of life. What will you give me if I betray him? What will you give me if I sell him? He's a taker. It's the epitome of sin. Sin at its core is always selfishness. It's all about me. It's all about what I can get. It's all about momentary pleasure. It's all about the temporary satisfaction. In fact, there was an occasion where a woman came in and she poured out something really expensive on Jesus as a gift. And Judas was the guy. He was the treasurer of the original disciples. So trusted that he held the bag. He held the money. And Judas said, this was a waste. This should have been sold and given to the poor. He wasn't concerned about the poor. Judas was concerned about Judas. He told on himself, what can I get? Keep reading verse number 15. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. It might interest you to know that in today's money, that is less than $4,000. So here's a man who sold Jesus and went to hell for $4,000. It pains me to say this tonight. Judas has been in hell for the last 2,000 years, and he will be there forever. Not because, not because he was not a religious man, not because he wasn't near, not because he didn't belong to the group, because Judas never accepted who Jesus actually was. He was in front of him. He he, he stood in front of him. He, He had his name on his lips, but not in his heart. 
He was so close, he could reach out and touch him. But now he is separated from God forever in an awful place called hell. By the way, I hear people in our world, excuse me, telling people to go to hell. I want you to know something. If they knew what hell was like, you wouldn't wish hell on your worst enemy. You know what hell is? Hell is fire. Hell is darkness. Yes. But hell is eternal separation from God and from every good thing because every good thing comes from God. $4,000. May I ask you something? What is Jesus worth to you? How do you value a soul? How do you put a price tag on eternity? Look at verse number 16. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Look down to verse number 20. Now, when the even was come, Jesus sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Would you mark that phrase in your Bible? One of you. One of you. Once you mark it, would you look at me? Are you the one? I must tell you as a preacher, there, there are messages I enjoy preaching and there are messages, frankly, I do not. I'm not preaching this message tonight because this is my favorite thing to talk about. I'm preaching this message tonight because I believe very definitely this is what the Holy Spirit wants me to talk about. In fact, I, I must tell you that for the last two or three hours, I've really struggled in my mind, in my spirit. I sat here a moment ago doing battle with myself because I really don't even like to talk about this. I don't even like to think about this. I stood on this platform last night and watched as a host of you stood and said, tonight I want to put my faith in Jesus. And, and you were born again. And I rejoiced. I stood here last night. A young man came back in and said, I got saved tonight. Man, it did my soul good. I met a young man today. He said, he said for years I, I thought I was saved. But he said, I got my salvation settled. Praise God for that. But listen to me. In a crowd this size, I'm concerned about the one. The one in your youth group. I'm going to stand before God someday for the messages I gave at this camp. And you're going to stand before God someday for the messages you heard at this camp. And the worst thing that could ever happen this week is somebody sit here all week long and have the time of their life and hear sermons from the Bible and miss Jesus and go to hell forever. The saddest story in all of Scripture is a man who knows something about Jesus but does not know Jesus. He is one of the disciples. He is in the number. He is at the table. And yet, he rejects Christ. Keep reading. Look at verse number 22. And they were exceeding sorrowful. And began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Do you understand? It would be better to have never lived than to live and never know Jesus. It would be better to have never been born than to live and die without ever being born again. It would have been better for you to have never been on this planet than for you to be accountable to God and knowingly have rejected his son, the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 25. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master. That's fascinating to me. He called him Master. He saw him as his Master, humanly speaking, but he did not accept him as the Messiah. Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Come down, please. To verse number 47, Jesus is in the garden now. He's been praying. The eleven were there. Verse number 47 says, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now, he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he hold him fast. This was... This is the Eastern custom, still in certain parts of the world. Instead of shaking hands, uh, fist bumping, uh, high-fiving, they, they kiss on the cheek. It was the customary greeting. He comes into the garden and he says, The guy that I go to and give the kiss of greeting to, that's the one. Look at verse 49. And forthwith, he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, 
Wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Turn a page in your Bible. Come to chapter 27, verse number 3. Jesus has now been condemned to death. And look at Matthew 27, verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. And brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. So now he's got remorse, but it's truth seen too late. This is not true repentance. He, he, he understands that Jesus was innocent. He knew that to start with. He's feeling sorry about it now. He's feeling sad about it now. But he's rejected Christ. He's crossed the great divide. And look at their answer in verse 4. You listen to me. The devil doesn't care that you go to hell. He's going to hell. Satan's going to hell forever. And he wants to take as many people with him as he possibly can. This world doesn't care if you know Jesus or not. Nobody cares about your soul like the Lord cares about your soul. Look how they respond. Verse number 4. They said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. And went and hanged himself. By the way, somebody asked me. Did Judas go to hell because he committed suicide? Is that the unpardonable sin? I want you to listen to me very carefully. Nobody goes to hell because of anything other than this. They reject Christ. They reject Christ. But for the record, while we're on it, let me throw this one in for good measure. To take a person's life is never the answer. In fact, it is the devil who is a murderer from the beginning. And guess who it is that wants you to end it all? And it's never the answer. It's the devil. The wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, said this, a living dog is better than a dead lion. I'd rather be a lion than a dog, but I'd rather be a living dog than be a dead lion. You know what he meant by that? As long as you're breathing, there's hope. Take a breath, would you? You're alive. How many of you are glad to be alive? Yes? If you're alive, look at me, God's not finished with you. If you're alive right now, there is a God in heaven who's reaching for you, who's working in you, who's drawing you to himself. And here's a man who finally comes to despair. Isn't that just like the devil to kick a man while he's down? Isn't that just like Satan to give you all his best up front and it's all downhill from there? Isn't it just like sin to promise what it can never fulfill until finally in despondency and utter despair you say, i got nothing to live for. It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. Oh, hear me, young people, tonight. There's a world of teenagers outside this camp that are dying tonight because they have no hope for this world and no hope for eternity. That hope is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you what Judas needed. I'm going to tell you what you need. I'm going to tell you what everybody you know needs. We need Jesus. Some of you think right now, well, this message is not for me tonight. I'll I'll tune in tomorrow night. Mm -mm. No, all of Scripture is for all of us. Do you see every person in this room tonight is either lost or you know someone that is. I'm standing right now on this platform thinking about a neighbor of mine. He's lost. I've been talking to him about the Lord. I was home the other day in West Virginia, and I was taking a little run on our country lane. We don't get much traffic out there. And and I heard something behind me, and it was a tractor. You know you live in the country when it's the tractor on the road. And it was my neighbor. He pulled up next to me. I've been praying for him. Pulled up next to me and turned the tractor off, started a conversation. In about two or three minutes, he said to me, I started going to church a little bit. I said, that's interesting. Tell me about that. He said, well, my grandson, Logan, he's been after me. And he said, he called me the other night weeping. And he said to me, Papa, if I die tonight, I, I know I'm going to heaven. I know Jesus. He said, but if you die tonight, I, I, I don't think you're ready to meet God. I don't think you're ready to go to heaven. And this man that I've been talking to and praying for and his wife's been praying for for a long time, suddenly God's starting to tend to his heart because his grandson, a young man, got concerned about his soul. We'll tell you what we need. We need every young man and every young lady in this camp, number one, to drive a stake a mile deep in the ground about your soul's salvation. Make your calling and election sure. There's some things you ought not live wondering about and worrying over, and one of them is your own salvation. The devil will leave you with a question mark. Jesus will straighten it out and make an exclamation point out of it. 
You need to settle once and for all that you belong to Jesus and he belongs to you. Your sins are forgiven. Your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. The Holy Ghost has come to live inside of you. You need to settle once and for all that you're a Christian. And then you need to start thinking about someone that you know that is lost that you want to take to heaven with you. See, I'm really not preaching on Judas tonight. You can be glad about that because that would leave us all very sad. Tonight, I'm preaching on Jesus. Because Scripture's not given to show us Judas. Scripture's given to point us to Jesus. Go back with me and let me show you some things about Jesus. Would you write them down somewhere? What do we learn from the story of Jesus and Judas? Number one, we learn that Jesus knows. This is interesting to me. But there were only two people that knew who the traitor was. Jesus and Judas. This is, it still blows my mind that even when Judas got up from the table to leave after Jesus had just said what he did, the rest of the disciples still didn't catch on. They thought, he's the treasurer. Jesus has sent him on important business. He's going to prepare something. I mean, this was a guy that was so well-respected Excuse me. This is a guy that's got such a great facade that everybody thinks he's all right. And I want to say to you tonight, it doesn't matter what others think about you and it doesn't matter what you say about you. It only matters what Jesus knows about you. When you stand before God someday, you will not stand with your friends. You'll stand face to face before the creator God of the universe. And on that day, you will look into the all-seeing eyes of a holy God and you will know that God knows everything about every one of us. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God answers that. He says, I, the Lord, try the hearts. The Lord looks beneath the surface right now and he knows your deep thoughts. He knows the imagination of your heart. He knows everything you're thinking at this moment. No, No preacher knows that. But the real preacher does. The Lord knows that Jesus knows. And frankly, you know. You know if you really know God or not. Is this a game? Is this something you check a box? Is this something that you, you just do to get the youth director off your back or to make everybody think you're all right and someday you're going to get it figured out? Or, or, or do you really know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Are you truly one of his disciples? I'm not asking tonight if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you, are you a member of a church? I'm not asking you, a good guy, you're trying hard. That's not what I'm asking you. You can stand in a garage all you want to. It never makes you a car. You can sit in a Christian camp every week of your life. Go to church every Sunday. It doesn't make you a Christian because the change Jesus brings doesn't start from the outside in. It starts from the inside out. Nobody can do it for you, and you can't do it for you. Only Jesus can do it for you. And Jesus knows if you've truly received him as your personal Savior. The stark reality is what you know and Jesus knows someday, everyone will know. On April the 14th, 1912, the ship that God himself could not sink, they said, cut through the icy waters of the North Atlantic. At 11.40, it hit an iceberg. It ripped open several watertight compartments. The ship started to list in a matter of moments. The Titanic slipped beneath the surface and thousands of souls perished. It was an awful night. It was a night for cowards. It was a night for heroes like John Harper who took off his life jacket and gave it to another man. Who swam from piece of debris to piece of debris as long as his numb body would allow him witnessing to people and asking them if they were ready to meet God. It was quite a night. The White Star Lines that owned the Titanic had a problem. It was prior to mass media and before the days of social media communication. They had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of family members and friends showing up at the port where the Titanic was scheduled to come in, ready to receive their loved ones, and they had to somehow announce what had happened. It was awful. So they built a platform, something like what I'm standing on tonight. They made two enormous banners. On one side of the platform, they hung a banner that said, known to be saved. And on the other side, they hung a banner that said, known to be lost. Then, they printed the name of every passenger on board the Titanic on a a piece of paper, on a placard, in big, bold letters. 
And they paid a young steward of the White Star Lines to come out as they could confirm people that were in the lifeboats, as they could confirm people that they, they had witnessed had slipped beneath the surface and had drowned at sea and were buried at sea. They would print their names one at a time. And this young steward would come out, and it was breathless silence. I mean, people, there was a hush as people just waited in anticipation. He would hold up a card until somebody in that audience would finally shout out, That's my mother. That's my brother. There he is. That's our son's name. And once somebody in the audience identified with that name, that young steward's job was to turn around and post it on one side or the other. They were either known to be saved, or God forbid, they were known to be lost. You know the ironic thing? Did you know the Titanic had three classes of passengers? When they left, based on how wealthy you were and how much you could pay, there were three different classes of passengers on board the Titanic. But when the whole thing came in, there weren't three classes of passengers. There were only two. There were those who were saved and there were those who were lost. I want to tell you, there's only two kinds of people in this room tonight. I'm not talking about male and female. I'm not talking about young and old. I'm not talking about educated and uneducated. I'm not talking about church people and non-church people. There's only two kinds of people in this room tonight. There are those who are saved by the blood of Jesus, and there are those who are lost because they have not yet received Christ as their Savior. And I'm telling you tonight, Jesus knows. There's a second thing I want you to know from the story of Jesus and Judas, and it is this. Not only does Jesus know, but number two, would you write this down? This is my favorite. Jesus loves. He loves. Do you remember that Jesus was called the friend of sinners? Let's take a survey. How many sinners are here tonight? Would you raise your hand? We're all sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. There is none righteous. There is none that seeketh after God. We're all gone out of the way. We are all together become unfruitful. Look. Every word of Scripture is a reminder that every last one of us, including the guy talking to you right now, is a black-hearted, hell-deserving sinner in desperate need of the mercy of God. If it wasn't for Jesus, I'd be in hell tonight or on my way to hell. But blessed be God, I'm not there and I'm never going there. Not because I'm a good guy, but because Jesus is a wonderful Savior. There is only one way of salvation, and His name is Jesus. I stood not long ago in the Garden of Gethsemane. A real garden. You can go there. You see the trees. Been there hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Some of them thousands of years. Standing in the Garden of Gethsemane on the side of the Mount of Olives, you are facing the old city of Jerusalem. There's only only one gate that you can see from there. It's the eastern gate. This is fascinating. There's eight gates around the city. All the other seven are wide open. You can go in Stephen's gate. You can go out the Dung Gate. All the gates are open. There's one gate that's still closed. It's the eastern gate. And the Muslim people have built a cemetery right outside the eastern gate because they knew the prophecy that someday Messiah, the king, would come through that gate into the old city of Jerusalem. So they put a cemetery there, and they said, no Jewish Messiah will ever come through this gate. I hate to tell them, but Jesus is coming through that gate someday. And when you stand there, you are looking across the Kedron Valley. And I'm standing there just, just, just weeks ago, and it hit me. From where Jesus was praying in the garden, he could see them coming. He could see them coming. Like it, it's the middle of the night. They're carrying torches and lanterns. They're, they're hunting him like an animal. They're, they're chasing him down like a criminal. They got their swords and their spears and their staves. And Judas is at the, the head of the pack and leading the mob through the, through the night, out the old city, across the Kedron Valley, Valley, across the brook, up the side of the Mount of Olives and into the Garden of Gethsemane. And when they got there, I'm going to tell you, that was one hateful group. I mean, they're hunting him down like a criminal. What a stark contrast between a group of people so filled with hate and a Savior so filled with love that he would stand there and wait on them to get there. People say, they killed him. 
Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. I'm just going to tell you right now, they didn't corner him like an animal and chase him and just nab him in the garden. Jesus stood there in perfect love and waited on them because this was the plan of God for our soul's salvation. By the way, the world you're living in right now still hates Jesus. They hate him. You ever wonder why nobody ever curses in anybody's name but Jesus Christ? I mean, seriously, when was the last time you heard somebody say Buddha? Nobody swears in Muhammad's name. Nobody talks about Confucius that way. Nobody uses Joseph Smith's that name that way. Nobody says Allah. Nobody uses any other name of any other religion as a curse word. Why the name of Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you why. Because there's only one name on earth that makes heaven rejoice and hell tremble. There's only one name on earth that Satan hates. There's only one name on earth whereby people can be saved, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know, as surely as they hated him that night, they hate him tonight. And if you identify with Jesus... They're not going to like you either because this world is so full of hate. So you got a world full of hate, and then you got Judas who is full of false affection. You see him kiss the Lord Jesus like a friend. Let this sink in. He kissed the door of heaven and walked away from it. He got so close to Jesus. I'm not going to kiss you, so relax, all right? I mean, I love you, but not that much. He got so close to Jesus. Look, he could reach out and touch him. But there was something between them. You know what was between them? Look here. Judas' sin. I want you to know tonight, if there's a separation between you and God, it's not God's fault. God hadn't moved. If there's something between you and God, it's not God, it's you. The the prophet said, your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you. What's between you and Jesus tonight? I'm going to tell you, I I wouldn't go to hell for anybody. I, I wouldn't lose my soul for anything. I wouldn't risk eternity for anything tonight. And no amount of false affection, no amount of pretending will do when you're standing before holy God. And in the midst of a hateful mob and a fake, there's Jesus. And every time I read this, it just hits me again. What was Jesus' first word to Judas when he came into the garden? We just read it a minute ago. What was the first word? Anybody remember? Friend. Now, I'm going to tell you, I can think of a lot of names for Judas and friend isn't one of them. If I had been Jesus, he comes into the garden, you traitor, you backstabber. I mean, think of all the things he could have said. He already knows, but oh, don't miss this, young people. He not only knows, he loves. Can I tell you, there was never a day God started loving you. He has always loved you. And there will never be a day he stops loving you because the Bible says he loves us with an everlasting love. Look, love isn't something God does. Love is who God is. God is love. Somebody says, why does God love us? God loves us because he can't help himself. It's who he is. He could never love you anymore, and he will never love you any less. The devil hates you. The devil will lie to you about the love of God. But I came to tell you tonight on the authority of the Bible that God Almighty loves your soul. You want to see how much he loves you? Look at the cross. Look at Jesus hanging there saying, I love you this much. Look at the Son of God taking your sin and your death and your judgment and your hell. Why does he do that? Because to the very end, he's a friend of sinners. And I think when he spoke with that tenderness friend to Judas, it was a reminder what the Bible says, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. Judas wasn't a saved man that lost his salvation. Judas was a man who never was truly saved because he never accepted the friendship of Jesus Christ. I can tell you with certainty tonight, Jesus is your friend. You will never have a better friend than Jesus because nobody else has ever died for you like Jesus did. The question is not, is Jesus a friend to us? The question is, are you a friend to him? Jesus knows and Jesus loves. There's a third thing that I want you to write down, please, and it is this, that Jesus proves. You ever wonder 
why all this had to happen in the garden? Did you know that on the other side of the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane was, there was a little town called Bethany? Anybody remember who lived at Bethany? His best friends on earth, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus was the guy he raised from the dead. How many of you think Lazarus might have hidden Jesus out for a little while? Yes. He could have just as easily slipped off the other side of the Mount of Olives and hidden out at Bethany. Instead, he stands right there and waits for them to get there. Why? Because he's proving. He, he stands there and waits on them that this is all a part of the plan of God. When they get there, if I had time, I'd take you to John's Gospel, John chapter 18. They come into the garden, and he says, Who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus gives this one simple answer, I am he. I am. Remember the Old Testament? I am that I am. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am, I am, I am. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. And when Jesus said, I am he, the Bible says in John 18, the power of his words made all of them fall to the ground. You want to know how hard the human heart can be when it rebels against God? The power of his answer put them all on their face and they still got up and arrested him. But Jesus stands there, speaks to them. Peter gets ticked off, pulls a sword, remember? Goes after a guy's head, misses his head, bad shot, chops his ear off. Blood everywhere, head wound, not good. Jesus looks at Peter and says, put your sword up. Bends over, picks up the guy's ear, and reattaches it to his head. Somebody said, how's he do that? He made the ear to start with, didn't he? The creator of all things can do anything he wants to. Look, for a Christ who stands in a graveyard and says, Lazarus, come forth, and he does, I don't think anything's too hard for the Lord. Do you know why he healed him? There was a message in the miracle. You know what it was? That Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he is. He is the Son of God, and he is the Savior of the world. He knows, he loves, and he proves. And you will have to determine which side you're going to be on. What a contrast between Jesus and Judas. On one side, you've got Judas. Did you know he is the only man in the Bible besides the Antichrist who is called the son of perdition? He's also the only man in the Bible besides the Antichrist that it says the devil entered into him. Someone just asked me, a teenager just asked me recently, can, can a Christian be demon-possessed? Absolutely not. May I just tell you, when you get saved, Jesus moves into your heart. He doesn't rent, he buys he doesn't move in and out. He moves in to stay. And when he moves in, he brings all of his own furniture with him. And there's not room in your heart for the Lord and the devil to both live there in the same place. God's greater than all of that. A saved man can never be possessed by the devil. This was a man that was consumed with the devil because he was never consumed with the Lord Jesus. He's just like the Antichrist that will come someday. He is standing against Christ. Look, please, you are either against Christ or you are for Christ. You're either against him or you're with him. And on the other side, you've got Jesus standing with nail-pierced hands saying, I love you. Won't you just come to me? I paid for your sins. Won't you be one of my disciples? Won't, won't you be one of my followers? A few weeks ago, I was in a camp, only there for two nights, Monday night, Tuesday night. On Monday night, we had a great meeting like we did here last night, lots of decisions and good things, and I was standing in the back of the meeting hall where we were, and a girl came around to me. I'd never met her before. When she started walking towards me, I could see it on her countenance. She was angry. I didn't know her, didn't know her story, didn't know her background. She starts telling me things that have happened in her family, things that were done to her. Terrible situation. She's wanting me to answer all these questions and tell her why this happened and why that person did this and how this could be true and on and on and on and on and on. And finally I said to her, I'm sorry, I don't think I can help you. And it kind of stunned her a little bit because I guess she thought I either was going to have the answers or I was going to get in an argument with her. And I said, I don't think I can help you, but I want to tell you one thing. She said, yes. I said, I don't know you and you don't know me, but I just want to tell you. Young lady, I called her by name. God loves you. And I can't fix every broken thing in your life and tell you why every bad thing has ever happened. But I want to tell you, God loves you and Jesus Wants to be your savior. She didn't like it. 
She kind of turned and stormed off. I prayed for her. Tuesday night, I preached. I'm standing in the back of the meeting hall. Another girl walks up. She said, do you remember a girl you talked to last night? Said her name. I said, yes. She said, she wants to talk to you again. <laughs> and I must be honest with you and tell you, I immediately, I was tired, and I just thought, I don't want to get in another argument. And about that time, she came around the corner, and immediately I could see something was different. She came over to me. She turned her back to everybody else. She started weeping. She said, I really don't want preacher. I really don't want everybody to see me crying. She said, but I've been thinking all day today about what you said to me last night. She said, I don't know why all these things happen either. And she said, I've got some hard things to deal with. She said, but I do believe God loves me. And, and I want to know him. We were in the back. We, we sat down two chairs over in a corner. I turned her chair so she wouldn't be facing everybody and wouldn't be embarrassed. I turned her chair. I wish you could have sat there with me. And I said to her, you want to pray? She said, yes, I want to pray. I wish you could have sat there with me and listened as she prayed and heard her talk to God. And I wish, I wish more than that. The second she said amen, I wish, I really wish you could have sat there with me and seen her countenance. You know, sometimes you can even see it on people's faces. It's like the burden lifts. The, 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 the brokenness suddenly turns to blessing. I, I can't explain to you the joy on her countenance. And she said to me, I know Jesus has forgiven me. She jumped up and she said, I got to go find my friend. She said, she'd been praying for me i got to tell her what Jesus has done in my heart. I'm telling you, the transformation in her spirit and then the transformation on her countenance, it didn't mean she was perfect and it didn't mean her life was perfect, but it meant she had a head-on collision with Jesus and when you meet Jesus, you cannot be the same. You know the saddest truth about Judas is found in Acts chapter 1. It's the last mention of Judas in the Bible. He's never mentioned after Acts 1. The Bible says that when he died, this is the word of Acts, he went to his own place. See, everybody has a place in eternity. You either have a place with God, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, or you have a place separated from God forever. Look at me, please. And God's not flipping a coin in heaven to decide for you. The Lord has done all the hard work and made the way of salvation available. And now he gives you the choice if you'll repent and believe the gospel. If you will look away from you and look to Christ alone for your soul's salvation. And I wonder tonight, do you know Jesus like that? If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.